The average American, like that average man of any country, has but little imagination. Mm -hmm. People who speak a different language or worship some other god or wear clothing unlike his own are beyond the horizon of his sympathy. He cares but little or nothing for the sufferings or misfortunes of those who are of a different complexion or another race. His imagination is not powerful enough to recognize the human being. If these inferior people claim equal right, he feels insulted. And for the purpose of establishing his own superiority, tramples on the rights of the so-called inferiors. Gentlemen and ladies, I stand here tonight because the Republic is in great peril. It is threatened. And as always with republics and democracies, those lone beacons in the vast dark sea of barbarism, the gravest threat is not from an enemy without. The death of every democracy begins when its citizens forget their history. If America, this noble undertaking fails, do not point an accusing finger at those foreign waves battering her wall. If America fails, it will be because Americans have failed her. Well, but before speaking on weightier matters, you should learn something of me. I was born the 11th of August, 1833, in upstate New York, town of Dresden. Small place, Dresden, about the size of a cat's hiccup. A small cat. What? My full name is Robert Green Ingersoll, I-N-G-E-R-S-O-L-L. -L. Friends call me Bob, B-O-B. -B. I hope all you will call me Bob. <laughs> Some will call me uh, Colonel. <laughs> uh, a relic left over from the late war between the states. At the onset of hostilities, so fierce was my love of country that I raised the 11th Regiment of the Illinois Volunteer Cavalry, which I commanded up through the Battle of Shiloh. War is horrid beyond the comprehension of man. It is enough to break the heart to go through the hospitals and see hundreds of your boys with thoughts of home meeting the dark angel alone. Nothing but pain, misery, neglect, and death. Everywhere, nothing but death. At the outbreak of that conflict, I recognized slavery as at its center. My father, you see, uh, John Ingersoll, was from early on a staunch abolitionist. He taught me virtue is of no color. Friendship, justice, and love of no complexion. He was a um, Congregationalist minister, and these radical views did not endear him to those to whom he preached. 
Time and again, whether in Michigan, Wisconsin, or Kentucky, for his convictions, my father was driven from his pulpit. I see the surprise on the faces of some. What? Robert Ingalls, all the great Satan? The foe of all religion? The son of a devout pastor? Alas, it is true. <laughs> the um, popular impression crediting my well-known animosity toward religion, uh, the result of a childhood under a father's brutal orthodoxy, is simply false. Yes, ours was a devoutly Christian household. But my father was a generous, liberal-minded soul who had but one misfortune, and that was his small-minded and bigoted parishioners who felt that the vilest sin for a Christian was to behave like one. Due to his liberal views, my father was brought before the church committee on the ridiculous charge of unministerial conduct in that dull little town of Madison, Ohio. <laughs> there, the church committee ruled his conduct free of blemish, but found his character inconsistent with his duties and forbade him to preach. My first demonstration of how unchristian Christians could be, hmm. it would not be the last. My father died not long after that trial. I was nine years old. Like the most of you, I was raised among people who knew? Who was looking? They did not reason or investigate. They had no doubt. They knew they had the truth. They had a revelation from God. They knew the beginning of things. They knew that God had commenced to create one Monday morning, 4,004 years before Christ. They knew that it took him Six days to make the earth. All plants, all animals, all life, all the globes of wheel in space. They knew exactly what he did each day and when he rested. They knew that God, for the purpose of civilizing his children, had destroyed some with storms of fire, killed others with his lightning, millions with famine, and had sacrificed countless thousands upon the field of war. They knew it was necessary to believe these things and to love God. They knew that God had created man in his own image and was perfectly satisfied with his work. <laughs> It says so in that purely scientific book called Genesis. Did none of you bring your Bibles? <laughs> Not to worry. I want mine. <laughs> to me, it seems easy to account for these ideas concerning gods and devils. They are a perfectly natural production. Man has created them all. Man has not only created all the gods, but generally he has modeled them after himself. Every people have created a god, and that god has hated and loved what they hated and loved. And he was inevitably on the side of those in power. Each nation made its gods and devils speak its language 
and put in their mouths the same mistakes of history, geography, astronomy. Why, these gods did not even know the shape of the worlds they had created, but supposed them perfectly flat. No god was ever in advance of the nation that created him. The truth shall set you free. Yeah, the first one went you angry. <laughs> Man in his ancient ignorance supposed that all phenomena were produced by some intelligent power to preserve friendly relations with these powers was, and still is, the object of all religion. Man knelt through fear. The, the lightning and the thunder terrified him. Uh, the great forest filled with wild and ferocious beasts, the boundless seas, the sinister eclipses, and more than all, the perpetual presence of death convinced him that he was the sport and prey of unseen and malignant powers. These ideas appear to have been universal in savage man. Our ancestors not only had their god factories, they made their devils as well. Generally, these devils were uh, disgraced and fallen gods. There is, in regard to them, a most wonderful fact. In nearly all the theologies, mythologies, and religions, the devils have been much more humane and merciful than the gods. No devil ever gave one of his generals an order to kill children and rip open the bodies of pregnant women. Second Kings 15, 16. Why one God, according to the accounts, drowned an entire world with the exception of eight persons. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh. <laughs> With the exception of eight persons, all were remorselessly devoured by a shoreless sea. The old and young, the bowed patriarch and the dimpled babe, the loving mother and the laughing child. No devil was ever accused of such fiendish brutality. The scriptures give us the most wonderful accounts of divine interference. Uh, animals talk like men. The sun stops in the heaven in order that General Joshua may have more time to murder. Fire refuses to burn. Water positively declines to seek its level, but stands up like a wall. Common walking sticks twist themselves into serpents and then swallow each other. Uh, prophecy becomes far easier than history. The sons of God impregnate the world's girls. Women are turned into salt. Bears tear little children into pieces for laughing at old men without wigs. Muscular development depends upon the length of one's hair. Dead people come to life. And um, when God himself becomes a stone cutter and engraver. Is there a Christian? in the whole world who would believe such stories if told in any other book. The trouble is these pious people shut up their reason and then open their Bibles. 
It's often asked of me, when this crusade of mine against religion began, In 1853, I taught a school term in Illinois. Throughout this period, I resided at this boarding house, along with a most devout Baptist gentleman. Each night, it was his practice to hold court at the dining room table and disclaim our matters religious in nature generally with me taking as small a part as possible. It was also in this period, thanks to my school's small library, that I discovered salvation in assorted volumes. Now, having spent my youth reading books about religion, the disobedience of man, Wickedness of pleasure, the impossibility of attaining heaven. Imagine my joy when first I read the poems of Robert Burns. Here was a natural, honest man, a man who loved this world, loved this life, and who placed above all else the ecstasies of physical love. <laughs> I read with rapture and read again. <laughs> I read Montaigne, a man so blessed with common sense that he was the most uncommon man of his age, the first in Europe to raise a voice against torture. Next, I discovered The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. This sublime and slandered soul who did as much to found the great republic as any man who ever stood beneath our flag, and who, for his antagonism of the church, has not one statue in this country honoring him. Then I found Shakespeare. I read all. I compared the plays to the sacred books. Romeo and Juliet to the Song of Solomon, Lear to Job, the Sonnets to the Psalms. And I discovered that there is more practical wisdom in one of the plays of Shakespeare than in all the sacred books ever written. There are treasures in books that all the money in the world cannot buy, but that the poorest laborer can have for nothing. Every library is an arsenal. One evening I left my school's library and made my way toward my lodging. It was a crisp night. The brightness of the full moon seemed frozen in a sharpness about me. And as I strolled forth, I pondered the nature of freedom. We call this America of ours free. But I found it was very far from free. It was boasted that here in America, church and state were divorced. And this I found to be untrue. I found that the church was supported by the state in many different ways. Our government should be entirely and purely secular, the thought I. The, re the religious views of a candidate should be kept entirely out of sight. He should not be compelled to give his opinion as to the inspiration of the Bible. These things are private. If we were in a storm at sea, 
with death wave washed and mass strained and bent. And in order to survive, it was necessary to cut the top sail. Well, we certainly would not ask the brave sailor who volunteered to go aloft, what is your opinion of the five points of Calvinism? As long as the people persist in voting for or against men on account of their religious views, just so long will hypocrisy hold place in power. Just so long will the candidates hide their opinions and pretend to agree with those whom they despise. It occurred to me that someone ought to do something toward making this country intellectually free. And as I crossed the boarding house porch, oh, it hit me that I might as well endeavor to do this as to wait for someone. That evening at the boarding house, my fellow lodger was in high feather. Indeed, it seemed he took my continued silence as a challenge. So he repeatedly and pointedly demanded of me my opinion of baptism. Till finally, sir, I will give you my opinion with soap. Baptism is a good thing. Thereafter, supper was a much quieter affair. <laughs> However, my remark from gossip to gossip spread throughout the community until the good Christians of that town uninvited me from my teaching position. After the war, I returned to the practice of law in Peoria. I married my lovely wife, Ava, and we began our family. And I gave myself over with wholehearted devotion to laboring for the Republican Party, the party that had saved the Union. I was appointed Illinois Attorney General, and I wrote and lectured with great success on such topics as Shakespeare and Thomas Paine. But on the topic of religion, I would not be silent, despite how many might desire it. The truth is, it is impossible to harmonize all the ills and pains and imperfections of this world with the idea that we were created by and are watched over and protected by an infinitely wise, powerful, and beneficent God. A very pious friend of mine heard that I had said the world was full of imperfections. He said that, in his judgment, it was impossible to point out an imperfection. Be so kind, said he, to name even one improvement you could make if you had the power. Well, said I, instead of disease, I would make good health contagious. The clergy balance all the real ills of this life with the expected joys of the next. Oh, we are assured that all is perfection in heaven. There the stars are cloudless. There everything is serenity and peace. Here, 
Empires can be overthrown. Dynasties extinguished in blood. Millions of men and women can toil beneath the cruel lash of oppression, and yet all is happiness in heaven. In heaven, they are too happy to have sympathy. The smiles of the deities are unacquainted with the tears of mothers. The shouts of hallelujah drown the sobs of earth. Of what use, ask I, have the gods been to man? Now, it is no solution to declare that in some other world, this God will render a few or even all of his subjects happy. What right have we to expect that a perfectly wise, good, and powerful being will ever do better than he has done and is doing? Can the conduct of infinite wisdom, power, and love ever change? Not if it's infinite. <laughs> Reading Bibles will not protect men against the blast of winter, but houses fire and clothing will. To prevent famine, one plow is worth a million sermons. And the hands that help are better than the lips that pray. The question naturally arises, how did man, even to the extent that he has, outgrow his abject terror and throw off the yoke of superstition? Probably the first thing that tended to disabuse man's mind was the discovery of order, of regularity in the universe. He noticed no matter what he might do, the motions of the planets were always the same. He discovered it was impossible for him to be bad enough to cause a hurricane, or good enough to stop one. He learned a few facts. And finding his sacred books incorrect or false in some particulars, his faith in their authenticity began to be shaken. This was the commencement of intellectual freedom. The first doubt was the womb and cradle of progress. And from that first doubt, man has continued to advance. Man began to investigate, and religion began to oppose. The civilization of man has increased just to the same extent that religious power has decreased. The intellectual advancement of man depends upon how often he can exchange an old superstition for a new truth. The church has never enabled a human being to make even one of these exchanges. On the contrary, all of her power has been used to prevent them. Yet, a man or woman had the goodness and courage to speak their honest thoughts. In every age, some thinker, some doubter, some brave lover of the truth, some heretic has gladly, proudly, and heroically braved the ignorance superstition and fury for the sake of mankind and truth. These divine persons were generally 
They're torn into pieces by the worshipers of the gods. <laughs> Socrates was poisoned because he lacked reverence for some of the gods. Christ was crucified by the religious rabble for the crime of blasphemy. Nothing is more gratifying to a religionist than to destroy his enemy at the command of God. The heretics are the noblest of our kind. They are the real saviors of our race, the destroyers of superstition, the creators of science. Galileo, Montaigne, Diderot, Voltaire, Newton, Jenner, and of course, Charles Darwin. Darwin was one of the greatest men who ever touched this globe. He was held up to the ridicule, the scorn, and contempt of the Christian world. And yet when he died, England was proud to put his dust with that of her noblest and grandest in Westminster Cathedral. Darwin has explained more of the phenomena of life than all the religious teachers. His doctrine of evolution, his doctrine of the origin of species has removed from every thinking mind the last vestiges of orthodox Christianity. Charles Darwin has conquered the intellectual world and his doctrines are now accepted facts. The church teaches that man was created perfect 6,000 years ago and has degenerated ever since. <laughs> you don't look degenerated to me. <laughs> you don't look degenerated to me. <laughs> Darwin demonstrated that man has for thousands of ages steadily advanced that the serpent did not tempt and that man did not fall. But, says the religionist, you cannot explain everything. You do not understand everything. And that which you do not understand, that which you cannot comprehend, is my God. What we we are explaining more every day. We are understanding more every day. Consequently, his, oh, his God is growing smaller every day. Now, we of science do not say that we have discovered all. We are the advocates of investigation, of inquiry, of thought. This of itself is an admission that we are not perfectly satisfied with our conclusions. Science has not the ego of religion. In the vast cemetery, called the past, are most of the religions of man. And there too are nearly all of their gods. Along the banks of the sacred Nile, Iris no longer weeps for the dead of Cyrus. Thor's hammer dashes mountains to the earth no more. The sacred fires of the Persians and the Aztecs have died out. Venus lies dead in stone. Her white bosom heaves no more with love. 
Religions are for a day. They are the clouds. Humanity is the eternal blue. I know that a great many people regard the Bible as the only moral guide and believe that in that book only can be found the true and perfect standards of morality. Well, on the whole, the Old Testament cannot be considered a moral guide. Jehovah was not a moral God. He had all the vices. He lacked all the virtues. He generally carried out his threats, but he never faithfully kept a promise. Now, I admit, there are many good things in the New Testament. And if we remove from that book the dogma of eternal punishment, the doctrine that prosperity is the result of wickedness, poverty and preparation for paradise, if we threw these away and took the good, sensible passages applicable to conduct, well, then we could make a fairly good moral guide. Narrow, but moral. If a man would follow today the teachings of the Old Testament, he would be a criminal. <laughs> if he would follow strictly the teachings of the New, he'd be insane. I will admit I do not believe in loving my enemies. I have pretty hard work to love my friends. <laughs> now, what does the Bible teach? Does it teach me mercy? Jehovah speaking. Happy shall he be that taketh thy little ones and dasheth them against the stones. Pretty good start for a merciful God, huh? Does the Bible give woman her rights? Does it treat woman as she ought to be treated? Paul speaking, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted for them to speak. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Imagine the ignorance of a lady who had only that source of information. <laughs> for the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man made for the woman. Well, then what was the man made for? <laughs> Celibacy is the essence of vulgarity. Now, you, my dear, you have read the Bible romance of the fall of Adam, yes? Well, you know, nearly every religion accounts for all the devilment in the world by some crime of a woman. If you ever meet a man who believes in the Garden of Eden story, slap his forehead, and you will hear an echo. Something is for rent. I am a believer in equal rights for women. Those men who declare that woman is the intellectual inferior man do not and cannot by offering themselves up in evidence, prove that point. We demand that woman be put upon an equality with man. Let us give women the opportunity to care for themselves because men are not decent enough to seek to care for them. We will never have a generation of great men 
until we have a generation of great women. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now there was a time among the Jews when if a man violated the Sabbath, they would kill him. They said God told them to do it. I think they are wrong. If not, if God did tell them to kill, well then I think he was wrong. Religion tends to draw the most the somber sort of folks. I was once in the presence of a minister who wore his God most gravely. Will you take a glass of wine? Asked I. I do not drink, said he. Oh. Will you smoke a cigar? I do not smoke. Maybe you'll take a chew of tobacco? I do not chew. Let us eat some hay. <laughs> what? I do not eat hay. Oh, well, then, good day, sir. You are not fit company for man or beast. <laughs> <laughs> I object to paying for the support of any other man's belief. And so I am in favor of the taxation of all church property. If that property belongs to God, he is able to pay the tax. <laughs> Church property should not be exempt from taxation. If you're going to exempt anything, exempt the home of the widows and orphans. But they say, <laughs> churches do good. <laughs> I don't know whether they do or not. Has not religion opposed every science from the first ray of light until today. Religion has built cathedrals for God and dungeons for men. The church has even tried to put down life insurance by saying it was sinful to bet on the time God has given you to live. They say missionaries to other countries. What for? Have we run out of sinners in this one? <laughs> you take a man from Pasadena, a Presbyterian. You send him to Turkey, and this Pasadena Presbyterian goes up to the Mohammedans and says, the Quran is a lie. That Muhammad was not a prophet of God, and he has it in a pamphlet. Why send this Presbyterian from Pasadena to a Sufi who says, better one moment of silent contemplation and inward love than 40,000 years of outward worship? Why give the Ten Commandments to a Jainist in India who surpasses all ten with his one? Do not injure, uh, abuse, oppress, enslave, insult, torment, torture, or kill any creature or living being. Now, I've read the Bible. What shall I say of it? Oh, I do not believe the Bible. A great many religious people say to me, what, do you know more than all the theologians? Well, being a perfectly modest man, I say, I think I do. <laughs> Every religion in this world is the work of man. Everyone. Every book has been written by man. Men existed before the books. 
If books had existed before man, well, I might admit there was such a thing as a sacred volume. Why do we need this? Why are we so afraid? Well, some say without religion, you destroy immortality. I do not. If we are immortal, it is a fact in nature. And we are not indebted to it for Bibles or for priests. And it cannot be destroyed by unbelief. The idea of eternal life was not born of any book. That wave of hope and joy ebbs and flows and will continue to ebb and flow as long as love kisses the lips of death. Life is a narrow veil between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud from the voiceless lips of the unreplying dead. There comes no word. But in the night of death, hope sees a star. And listening, love can hear the rustling of a wing. I know how vain it is to gild a grief with words. And yet I wish to take from every grave it's fear. Why should we fear that which comes to all that is? We cannot say we do not know which is the greater blessing, life or death. We do not know if the grave is the end of this life or the door to another, or whether the night here is not somewhere else at dawn. There is in death nothing worse than perfect sleep. We have no fear. We are all children of the same mother. The same fate awaits us all. Every newborn cradle looks out with fear. Where am I? And every coffin, where to? Is there a God? I do not know. Is man immortal? I do not know. I do not deny. I do not know. The only difference between me and all the theologians is that I am honest. There may or may not be an infinite being, but I do not believe. I do not believe that Jesus Christ is the ruler of our nation. If he is the ruler of one nation, he is the ruler of all nations. Why does he not then rule one country as well as another? The revealed word of God is not the standing of civil justice in this country. The Bible is not the standard of the right and wrong or of decency in this country. There are people in this country who say we are getting too secular, too scientific. Now, is it not a fact that we are happier today than at any time in all human history. Some of you may realize, despite my long association with the Republican Party, that I have never held public office. 
The reason for this is that I was not considered a safe candidate. This was not due to my opposition to the barbarity of the penitentiaries, nor my, my stand against the employment of capital punishment, nor was it due to my strong support for women's rights or those of the Negro race. It was solely due to my views on religion and its status in this country. Some time ago, before I had achieved the national recognition I carry today, my name was put forward to stand as a candidate for the governorship of Illinois. Some spoke of this being the first state to greater office. But the delegates, notwithstanding the high regard they said they held for my person, would not launch the bark of their aspiration without some assurance that it would not be dashed against the jagged rocks of my mouth. <laughs> Hence, a committee was formed to have of me my pledge that while campaigning, I would refrain from offending the religious of this country. This committee came to my home to seek this pledge of me. I came down before a parlor and greeted them. Gentlemen, said I, goodbye. I am not asking to be the governor of Illinois. My religious belief belongs to me. It is mine, not the state of Illinois, nor this nation. Why, I would rather refuse to be the President of the United States than to smother one sentiment of my heart. It is easy to sail along with the majority. Easy to sail the way the boats are going. Easy to float with the stream. But when you come to swim against the tide with the men on shore throwing rocks at you, you will get a good deal of exercise in this country. I will admit, my good friends, that afterwards I found myself in a solemn frame of mind. My lovely Ava observed me as such. She came over and stood beside me, resting her hand on my shoulder. Your father, said she, would never have been proud of you. <laughs> my wife, a great woman, and my, my two daughters, great women in training. <laughs> it is a splendid thing to think that the woman you really love will never grow old to you. Through the wrinkles of time, through the mass of years, if you really love her, you will always see the face you loved in one. And a woman who really loves a man does not see he grows old. He is not depressed. He does not tremble. She always says the same gallant gentleman who won her hand and heart. The man who has really won the love of one good woman in this world. I do not care if he dies in the ditch of beggar. His life has been a success. Of course, for my beliefs, the religious say, you will burn in hellfire. <laughs> do not 
trust in those in whom the urge to punish is strong. Is it necessary that heaven should borrow its light from the glare of hell? Hell, this infamous doctrine of eternal punishment. I, I will be frank with you and say, I hate the doctrine. I loathe it. And I have no respect for the man who preaches it. Think of the lives this fear of hell has blighted, of the tears it has caused. Think of the millions who have been driven to insanity. Christianity has made more lunatics than it ever provided asylum for. My father, my father believed in the truth of damnation. And whenever he thought of the souls condemned to hell, his eyes would fill with tears. My father was infinitely better than the religion he preached. This doctrine of eternal punishment, it renders God the basis and most cruel being in the universe. I have always noticed how the people who have the smallest souls make the most fuss about getting them saved. Your pastor, reverend preacher says that the sovereignty of God implies that he has an absolute right to dispose of his creatures as he will, because he made them. Suppose I come to this book and immediately change it into a human being. Would I have the right to torture him because I made him? No, of course not. On the contrary, I would say, Having brought you into existence, it is my duty to do the best for you I can. The clergy view me as their enemy, and rightly so, because the clergy know that I know, that they know, that they do not know. <laughs> the mighty churchmen of today will always bring to my mind a verse of the German poet Heine. Christ rode upon an ass. Today, the asses ride on Christ. There are in this country some Christian lawyers, some eminent and stupid judges, who have said and still say that the Ten Commandments are the foundation of all law. Nothing could be more absurd. Thousands of years before the birth of Moses, India, China, Egypt had codes of laws. Laws against blasphemy, adultery, laws for the collection of debt. Laws were made against murder because a very large majority of the people have always objected to being murdered. <laughs> Let me now return to that threat to our republic that I mentioned earlier. Churches are becoming political organizations. 
It probably will not be long until the churches shall divide as sharply upon political as upon theological questions. And when that time comes, if there are not liberals enough to hold the balance of power, this government will be destroyed. The liberty of man is not safe in the hands of any church. Look at our world. Wherever you find God and sword in partnership, man is a slave. The religious in this nature would have the Bible taught in our schools. Children should be taught to reason, not to believe. And why does the same God tell me how to raise my children when he had to drown his? The religious in this nation have made three attempts at amending the Constitution to include their God. The first in 1864, again in 1874, and finally in 1897. All three failed. Otherwise, the Constitution would read, we the people of the United States, recognizing Almighty God, the divine authority of Holy Scriptures, and Jesus the Messiah, in order to form a more perfect union. If God is allowed into the Constitution, man must habitate. There is no room for both. If the people of the great republic become ignorant enough and superstitious enough to place God in the Constitution of the United States, the experiment in self-government will have failed. There was a time the church ruled and knowledge was despised, reason was an outcast. The sun was blotted from the intellectual heaven and there fell upon the world that shadow, that midnight known as the Dark Ages. This night lasted for a thousand years. Religion has not civilized man. Man has civilized religion. God improves as man advances. Religion can make good men somewhat better. But generally it only makes bad men worse. Perhaps it comes down to this question. Is the Bible the word of God? Well, if it is, it should be a book that no man, no number of men could produce. It could contain the perfection of knowledge. There should be no mistakes in geography, astronomy, or any subject. Its morality should be the highest, the purest. Its laws and regulations should be just, wise, and perfectly adapted to the accomplishment of the ends desired. It should contain nothing calculated to make men cruel or vengeful. It should be filled with intelligence, mercy, justice, and the spirit of liberty. It should be opposed to war, to slavery, to ignorance and brutality. It should please the heart of the best and the brain of the wisest. It should be True. Does the Bible satisfy this standard? One last issue I, I wish to discuss. I read recent an article 
written by a rather vexed minister. And in this article, he ranted that secularism was the religion for those who denied religion. And he meant this as a slander. I began to ponder this. Secularism, concluded I, is the religion of mankind. It embraces the affairs of this world. It is interested in everything that touches the welfare of a sentient being. It advocates attention to the particular planet in which we happen to live. It means that every individual matters. It is a declaration of intellectual independence, a protest against theological domination. It proposes to let the gods take care of themselves. Secularism is another name for common sense. Secularism is trying to do away with violence and ignorance, poverty and disease. It lives for the ever present today and the ever coming tomorrow. It does not believe in praying and receiving, but in earning and deserving. It regards work as worship, labor as prayer, and wisdom as the savior of mankind. It says to every human being, take care of yourselves. Take care of yourselves so that you may be able to help others. For we rise by lifting others. Adorn your lives with those gems called good deeds. Illuminate your path with that sunshine called friendship and love. I am a believer in the eternity of progress. I do not believe that poverty will dwell among man forever. I do not believe that prisons will forever cover this world and that the shadow of the gallows will forever fall upon the ground. I do not believe that injustice will sit forever on the bench. I believe the time will come when law and justice and liberty like the atmosphere will surround this world. I do not believe in forgiveness as it is preached by religion. We do not need the forgiveness of God, but of each other and ourselves. If the homeless are to be sheltered, if the hungry are to be fed, if justice is to be done, and if the right is finally to prevail, all must be the work of man. Yes, secularism is a religion a religion that is understood. It is real religion. Secularism is America's religion. Thank you.